this morning. So good to see all of our guests. I know Sam already mentioned, but we're just thrilled to have all of our guests with us and return guests and family that's visiting with, with others. Uh, it's just so good to have all of you in the house of the Lord today. Let our guests, church family, let our guests know we're happy that they're here. We're glad for our webcast viewers that are watching this morning as well. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 4, and um, we'll begin reading at verse number 8 in just a moment. Uh, when you came in today, uh, and if you didn't get one of these cards, don't worry, we'll make sure you get one of these. You were probably handed a card that looked like this. If you're a, a, a part of this church, certainly we don't expect our guests to, to give unless you, the Lord would, would lean on you to give. Uh, but you may have received a card like this, and I'm going to be very upfront and intentional about where I'm headed today with this message. Uh, God has uniquely positioned New Life Church here in Cabot to be at a place of growth and be at a place of revival. And because of that, it is pressing us facility-wise. And uh, now you may look around this morning and say, well, I see some empty chairs here. Uh, when you look at the, the totality of the church, uh, there are times, and uh, when they told me this, I just shuddered, Sister Lindsay, when I heard this. There are times in some of our classrooms next door, uh, in a 12 by 12 room, that they've had 16 children in one room. Now, here's the risk I take in saying that. You're going to go, oh my goodness, they're stacking them in there. Well, we're trying our best to, to, to be fluid and to, to move and to grow and, and to make modifications as we need. But we need more space as a church. And so uh, part of what, everybody say part Part of what I'm going to talk about today will bring us to the place of commitment for those that feel to do that, to help us financially for what will be the next stage of expansion of our church facilities. However, however, God has assured me that he wants to do more than a building campaign today. Amen. So if you will engage with the word of God spiritually today, I believe God's going to speak to our hearts I believe God's going to move something inside of us to help us and to really go far beyond buildings and far beyond facilities and all of that. So why don't we do this? With that in mind, let's pray before we read one verse of Scripture. And if you're wanting just to be open to the Holy Ghost today, would you tell God that right now? Lord, I'm open. I'm open to your spirit today. I want to hear what your spirit's going to speak to me, Lord. Lord, without a doubt, you are here. And when you are here, hearts can be touched, Lord. People's lives can be ministered to, Lord. And I'm grateful for that. I thank you that you've gone before your word and you've prepared us, Lord, for everything that will happen in this house today. Oh, Lord, I pray there will be a mighty visitation of the Holy Ghost. Confirm your word by letting the gift of faith operate here today. And for that, I will praise you and give you glory. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone say, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're at 2 Kings chapter number 4. And uh, I will read uh, three verses of Scripture beginning at the 8th verse. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem. Now let's make sure we're identifying. Elisha is a prophet. And he is going to this city called Shunem. There was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food now you'll have to forgive me but my imagination runs wild when i read the bible i really have never had to have a woman persuade me to eat food <laughs> i do that fairly regularly on my own and yet the Bible, if it's in the Bible, it must be true, huh? She persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. Here goes my imagination again. The gal must have been a pretty decent cook. You ever heard anybody say that life is too short to waste a meal at Denny's? <laughs> Oh, I got all the Denny's lovers mad at me now. I like that grand slam, Brother Gaddy. She said to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please 
Let us make a small upper room on the wall, and let us put a bed for him there, and a table, and a chair, and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Can you say amen? Amen. I want to preach about making room. Turn to a couple of people and say, making room. Look right back at them and say, we're making room. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If you were to take your smartphone this afternoon and go to Google Maps, and at the address you want to go to, punch in 525 South Winchester Boulevard in San Jose, California. Number one, it would take you a while to drive there. It would take you probably about two plus days to get there if you drive hard. Um, When you get to that address, you will see this house. That's a pretty pretty big house. That is known as the Winchester Mansion, (laughs) appropriately called. It is a mansion. Um, It was once the personal residence of Sarah Winchester, the widow of a firearm magnet by the name of William Winchester. And it is renowned because of its size, number one, And secondly, it's architectural curiosities because it was built without any master building plan. Zero. No forethought. Now, it looks like on the surface that it's still standing. And yet, if you were to go and research where is the filed building plans, you will never find them for the Winchester Mansion. It's currently designated as a California historical landmark, and it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It's now privately owned, and it serves as a tourist attraction. After her husband's death, Miss Winchester, this was back in 1881, inherited more than $20.5 million dollars upon her husband's death. That's equivalent today to about $520 million. That's a pretty nice inheritance. She also received nearly 50% ownership of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, giving her an income of roughly $1,000 per day in her years, equivalent to $25,000 a day today. That's a pretty nice daily stipend. And these inheritances gave her a tremendous amount of wealth, which she used to fund ongoing construction on that mansion. It was in 1884 that she actually purchased that farmhouse, which was much more modest than it shows on the screen right now. It's in the Santa Clara Valley. And she began building it from a farmhouse into a mansion. Here's what she did. She said, I want carpenters here, and I'm going to hire them to work on this house day and night until I say so. So literally, carpenters were working around the clock. Hundreds of workers worked on this house at one time. It became such a large house that the workers themselves started staying in the house, and it turned into quickly a seven-story mansion. She did not use an architect at all, and she added on to the house in a very haphazard fashion so that the home contains numerous oddities like Doors and stairs that go absolutely nowhere. Windows that are overlooking other rooms. And stairs with odd-sized risers. I saw one picture that I thought I would spare showing you of one of the bathrooms that had a window in the bathroom. 
Now, I'm going to let that just sink in for a moment. You may say, well, that's normal. Our bathroom in our house has a window. No, this was a window on the door of the bathroom. <laughs> huh. So you can tell who we're dealing with here. She gets to building, gets to constructing, and it seems very haphazard. Now, go with me in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. And although it may seem quite a strange segue to go from the Winchester house to the first letter that Peter wrote as an epistle, 1 Peter chapter 2, allow me to draw some parallels in the scripture. 1 Peter chapter number 2. This is a familiar passage of those that maybe have read the Bible for a while in your life. When Peter says this, verse number 9, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now, everyone say, but now but now have obtained mercy. I wonder just quickly on this Sunday morning, how many of you know what it feels like to not be a people and then God gets a hold of your life and you are not just a person, but you are God's special child. I know I have that testimony this morning. I was a nobody, but he made me a somebody because of his cross, because of his sacrifice. I love what Peter says, you were not a people, but now you are people. You had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Thank God for his mercy today. Thank God that he didn't give you and me what we deserve, but he gave us what we didn't deserve. He didn't give us what was coming to us. He gave us what he brought us through the sacrifice of the old rugged cross. Thank God for mercy. Thank God for grace today. Come on, do I have any grateful people in this house? You're thankful he didn't leave you where he found you, but he picked you up and turned you around and set your feet on solid ground. He's a merciful God. But Peter says it very clearly in that eighth verse. He says, you are a holy people. To be holy means literally by definition to be distinct, to be separate, to be a people that does not view life like everybody else views life. I am preaching today behind a pulpit looking at a congregation of holy people distinct people, separate people. And I want to make sure we get this across at the very beginning of this message. When I am a holy child of God, I don't look at things like everybody else looks at it. When I am a distinct child of God, that's not a license to be arrogant, but friends, we don't look at church like everybody else does. I don't look at Sunday mornings as a job or a 90-minute period of my week when I kind of scratch an itch that says I ought to go to church. I don't look at giving in the offering as some duty that God pins me down and says you got to give me your money, but rather I look at what we're doing today as a little snapshot of eternity. I look at what we're doing today as practice for the great by and by. One of the These days we're going to worship with great abandon around the throne of heaven. And so I've made up in my mind, I'm going to get a little practice on eternity and praise right here. I'm going to rise up in my spirit and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. We're a holy people. We look at things differently. We don't look through the same eyes as everybody else. I don't look at y'all like everybody else sees you. 
I don't see. There are people here today that if I would pass the microphone around, you would say, well, Brother Gaddy, you don't know me. I'm inconsistent, and I start, and I stop, and I start, and I stop, and I fail, and I succeed, and I fail, and I all back and forth. But here's what I know. I don't come to the, the throne of God today in my own power. I don't come touting my own goodness. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer today. Lord, if you're looking for someone that's undone and frail and weak, I'm at the top of the list. But I don't come to you shouting how bad I am. I come to you declaring how great you are. And I'm going to get my attention off of me and I'm going to put it on you. That's how holy people view things. We view things differently. Holy people view buildings differently. This is, for those of you that are new to our church, this is a building that's about 12,000 square feet. And um, I won't take the time today to recount every miracle uh, that has happened in this building. And when I say miracles, I'm not just talking about physical healings. There's been plenty of those. But even us sitting in this room right now is a miracle. Suffice it to say, the previous owners of this building, our name's on the deed now, but the previous owners of this building told us when we moved in that part of the building, the front third of this building, years ago. Now, Pastor, we want you to know that we will never sell this building. I want you to know that. I want you to be clear right up front. You can lease that part from us, but this is our retirement this monthly income from the lease. It's our retirement. We are never going to sell. But you know what I found out about six years ago? God retires people. <laughs> oh, yes, he does. I really rem I remember where I was, and the reason why I remember where I was was because it was an unusual situation. I was on the treadmill. <laughs> kind of like being in a foreign country, you know, you remember it. <laughs> and my phone rang, and it was the owner of this building. And she said to me, uh, Tim, do you have just a second? I was out of breath. I kind of calmed down. I said, yeah, yeah, everything okay? She said, well, my husband and I were talking, and we don't know why we're doing this. She said, but we want to sell the building, and we want to sell it to you. Not, not to me, but to the church. And have you ever had one of those moments when you didn't do it out loud, but you wanted to go, <laughs> So, Brother Tom, I choked it back. She said, would you be interested? And I didn't have time to call a board meeting. I didn't have time to call a members meeting. I said, yes, we're very interested, very interested. God worked it out, and uh, we're sitting here today because of the miraculous hand of God. I remember over on that side of the building when God spoke to me one day at the end of a service, and here's what he said. He said, the days of miracles are not behind you. But they are ahead of you. I remember when this great lady, Stacy Gaddy, stood up. Some of you may remember this. We were having David Smith, an evangelist, with us for the very first time. He's been with us many times now. But he was uh, preaching, and we added a Sunday night service that weekend. And he, he wanted us to stand up and just begin to declare what God was going to do. Just prophesy what God was going to do. And there was just such faith in the room. And I watched as my wife stood up, and he went running back and handed her the microphone. And here's what she said. She said, I am prophesying that God's going to give us this building. I'm prophesying that God's going to help us to buy this building. God's going to help us to build a building out in that field out there where we're parking this morning. God's going to help us to build a building. Let me tell you something. You got to be careful. She'll prophesy. <laughs> now, all kidding aside, the spirit of prophecy was on our pastor's wife. She said, I see it in my mind. Here's what I'm praying happens today, that somehow through the power of the Holy Ghost, somebody's faith will rise up. Come on, I'm preaching to holy people right now. People that see things differently. I don't see it as just another building. I see it as the future of God's church. I see it as the expansion of the kingdom of God. Praise God.
Everybody say holy people. people. Now, this passage that I read from in our text is one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. Because it involves some uncanny behavior. Some behavior that seems to be a little bit out of orbit to the normal flow of life. What we do know is that the woman was from Shunem and she was a notable woman. One version of the Bible says she was an important woman. She was probably one of those gals that when she showed up in the town square, everybody went, oh, she's here. She's a notable woman. She's not just blending in with everybody else. And yet, the scripture tells us just by way of of just normal flow of of scripture that she was a cook and she would watch his people and she obviously had the gift of hospitality and Elisha the prophet would come by. But, but, But the scripture says that she would cause him to turn in and to eat there. And and as I'm reading the story, it dawns on me, notable people, one of the greatest hindrances of notable people is it's easy for them to keep their attention on themselves. Important folk. People that people look to. And it's easy. Uh, have, have you ever, I know I ask a lot of questions, but have you ever walked into a room and... Uh, had everybody kind of turn and just look at you. And the first thing that goes through my mind is, why are they looking at me? Here's what I know about the Shunammite woman. She was a notable woman. She was an important woman. But in order to access the miracle that God had for her, she had to get the attention off of herself and put it on somebody else. She had to say, you know what? It's not about the prophet coming by and saying, wow, you're a notable woman. It doesn't matter how notable I am. I've got to divert the attention off of myself. And can I tell you something, folks? If we're going to access everything God has for us in the future, we've got to quickly, let me just say it for Tim Gaddy. I've got to quickly get the attention off of myself and say, not my will be done, but your will be done, Lord. Not my agenda, not my plan. I give it to you. She was a good cook. He passed by. He ate the food. And yet the scripture doesn't stop there. The Bible says that what started as a regular occurrence transitioned into a holy occurrence. Because the longer these visits went on, the more apparent its holiness became. Now, let me stop just to say this. This is actually counterintuitive to how most things happen. Most of the time, the longer we do something, the less sensitivity we have toward it. Or can I say it like this? The less special it becomes. Now, I grew up going to church with hymnals. How many give witness to that? You know, you're old enough to remember those days, hymnals. They were in the back of the pews, not chairs. We didn't have chairs back then. Pews in the little sleeve, little box thing. Or, in my case, growing up, all the ushers would carry them. And pass them out and then retrieve them when we got done singing. And so that's my context. And uh, we would get to singing and we would get to rejoicing on Sunday morning, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights. And um, I would get to where I could sing a song, clap my hands, and carry on a conversation at the same time. Let's, let's do this. Everybody, uh, watch this and follow me. Ready? Good, good. That's good. That's good. Now, if you've ever been in a service when someone didn't know how to clap, for the people with rhythm, that'll drive them crazy. According to musicians, you're supposed to clap on the two and the four, 
not the one and the three. Let me prove this to you. Won't we have a time when we get over yonder? Won't we have a time? Now, some of y'all right now are saying there's nothing wrong with that. The musicians in here are fixing to walk out right now. Because that's clapping on the one, three, one, three. We're learning something today. This is awesome. <laughs> Rather, we're to sing and clap. Won't we have a time when we get over? All the musicians just got happy right there. <laughs> so that's how I grew up. I grew up doing multitasking and getting so used to I'll fly away that I could sing, I'll fly away, clap on the two and the four, and say, it's great to see you, all at the same time. <laughs> because human nature is such that many times the longer we do something, the less sensitivity we have to it. And yet in this story of 2 Kings chapter 4, it was exactly the opposite. The more this holy man walked by, the more holy the environment became. The more often Elisha happened to walk by the house. After time number three, after time number five, after time number seven, now it no longer became a man coming for dinner, but now there's a holy presence about this. There's a holy element of this visit. Hey, honey, she looked at her husband. She said, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. I would pray that although we've now been in existence for over 18 years as a church, now more than ever, we wouldn't get desensitized to the moving of the Holy Ghost. But now more than ever, we would say, God, you are doing something holy in our midst. You are doing something great in our midst. I perceive a holy visitation of the Lord. See, what started as a regular occurrence became a revelation of a holy visitation. And that context, that progression, set this woman and her husband up for a decision. So she said, Sweetheart, here's what I think we need to do. Tomorrow morning, I'd like you to get in your F-250. <laughs> what, have you been there before or something? I mean, my goodness. <laughs> Some of you guys are going, well, I've heard that before. <laughs> Go down to Home Depot, and they got a special on treated lumber. Because here's what I think we need to do. Because something holy is happening, we need to make some room. Because something holy has decided to visit regularly by our house, it causes an action to take place. In other words, honey, we can't just sit here and get used to a holy visitation. Because I'm not just thinking about the present, receiving him now, but I'm wanting to make sure that he consistently stops by this house. And so we are going to position ourselves through action to enlarge the room, enlarge the house, enlarge the territory. Why? Because we want to encourage his return. Hear me today. When we start talking about putting another building on this property, we're not doing that to say, wow, New Life has a new building on their property. We have hundreds and thousands of cars that drive by this every single day. We're not doing this to promote the name of New Life Church. But what we are preparing to do is an action, a bold action, an expensive action. But the reason why we're doing that is we're saying, Lord, for 18 years, you've been passing by this church. For 18 years, you've been visiting our services. For 18 years, you've been coming by, and we want through our faith and our action to tell you we want it to continue. We want more people to know it. We want more people to experience it. And so, we're going to make some room. We're going to make some room. 
Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Isaiah. The Lord laid this verse on my, script, on my heart early this morning. Isaiah chapter 54. And it is a powerful verse. Isaiah 54 and verse 1. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Now, that seems almost cruel for the Lord to say to Isaiah, write these words down. Sing, O woman that's never had a child. Sing, O woman who is barren. Because all we have to do is take a little bit of a survey of the word of God at what barrenness meant to a woman. And it was something that stained her. It was something that afflicted her. It was something that was not uh, something to be proud of. Women wanted to have children. And yet the prophet says, in that kind of state, when nothing seems to be happening, sing! Lift up your voice and sing, O barren woman. Watch what verse 2 says. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Ah, oh, pastor, we don't need a bigger building. We got chairs that are empty here right now. Please understand from a pastor's standpoint, I look at the whole of this church. I look at children wadded up in, building, in rooms next to us and trying to expand and trying to modify and adjust. Can I tell you something? We start thinking about expanding this facility. We start thinking about the next phase of construction here at the church. We are not doing that because we have it all figured out. We're doing it by faith. Hear me, we can't separate faith from expansion. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to enlarge our tents. <laughs> and then we're also going to strengthen our stakes. That's what holds us grounded. So let me tell you what this pastor is going to do for the next mo few months and uh, a while as we get ready to build is I'm going to make sure we are doing the practical things of getting a building put up. But I'm also from time to time going to get behind that pulpit and strengthen our stakes. So that in, the, in the midst of expansion, we never move past where God brought us from. Come on, enlarge your tents. Strengthen your stakes. You don't see it yet, but don't wait till you see it, honey. Go ahead and start singing and enlarging and strengthening right now. And here's what the Lord said to Isaiah. Here's what's going to happen when you do that. Isaiah, chapter number 54. For you shall expand to the right and to the left and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited Whew. let me just tell you what i see i see a building crammed full of people at an altar receiving the holy ghost I see a baptistry with people one after another being water baptized in the name of Jesus. I see a day when there's going to be so many people being baptized. We got to baptize them at the same time in the same pool right there, two or three of them together. I see that coming. Pastor Jimmy, I see the day when this building right here is going to be filled with people with hurts and habits and hang-ups. I see the day when children are multiplied in our midst. So in order to get to that day, I got to make room. 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 Now, this is really common sense if you think about it. Once mom finds out she's expecting, they start making room. She's not even showing yet. And they're choosing blue paint. Kicking that kid out of the room because brother's coming. 
<laughs> Can you imagine if, ladies, you went through a whole pregnancy and you start having those Braxton Hicks things going on? See, I wanted to act like I knew what that was, what I was talking about. <laughs> I just know she had those. So that makes me sound like I know what I'm talking about. And you're breathing. <sighs> Honey, we got to go to the hospital. Can you imagine if that moment you thought, you know, we probably need to think about a room for this kid. <laughs> so BJ, I could walk up to the, the husband and say, have you thought about it? We really haven't thought about that. How long you've been expecting? We've been expecting for nine months. She's been showing for what, six, seven of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the thing. I'm expecting, and this is a news flash for you. I hear, I'm here to make an announcement this morning. I'm expecting. <laughs> Get that on the webcast for all of eternity to hear that. Tim Gaddy is expecting. Testing one, two, three. I am expecting. And you know what? It's not going to take two months to start showing. So when I see you, I'm going to say, Pastor Nate, I'm expecting. And because I'm expecting, we got to get the room ready. we got to start preparing because there's a harvest coming. There's a child coming. There's a family coming. So you know what I'm going to do? I am going to personally invest in the expansion. I'm going to be personally involved in that. So let me bring this down to a close. Everybody say making room. We've got to make room for what God is doing and what he will do. I'll finish with this. Earlier this year on January the 9th, because I wrote it down in my journal, the Lord began to deal with me about the process of building the church, building. And he directed me to the book of Exodus chapter 35. And I won't take an exhaustive amount of time and teach a Bible study from this, but what I will tell you is this. Moses uh, said this, first of all, people have to have willing hearts. Everybody say willing hearts. And people's hearts have to be stirred. That's Exodus 35 and 5. Before there's going to be a tabernacle built, before there is one sound of construction, there has to first be a stirring of hearts. There has to be a stirring up of a willingness inside of us to be a part of what God is doing and what God will continue to do. Number two, God will inspire and God will anoint workers and designers to help build the tabernacle. This is Exodus 35, verses 30 and 33, or 233. Bible says that Moses recognized there was anointing on some men who were craftsmen. And there was an anointing upon workers to build the tabernacle. See, I'm not just interested in our church hiring a company to build this building. I want God's anointing on them. I want God's anointing on the people that help design this next building. We can't afford not to have God's anointing on every step of the way. So hearts are stirred. God inspires and anoints workers. And then number three. There is regular, sacrificial, bountiful giving. Regular, meaning it is systematic. It's not haphazard. It's not just something kind of thrown together. Sacrificial, meaning it doesn't come out of just my Starbucks money. Now, here's the risk I take in saying that. And... Each of us know whether that's a sacrifice or not. But if I get Starbucks every single day, giving that money is not a sacrifice. It's sacrificial. It's going beyond. It is reaching down beyond what I would normally spend. And then number three, it is bountiful. I am amazed in the book of Exodus chapter number 36, verses 4 through 7, that the Bible says that people began to give. They gave regularly. They gave every day. And they brought to the tabernacle site their offerings. And it got to the place, this, I'm not making this up, Exodus 36, verses 4 through 7, it got to the place where the artisans and the workers and those that God had anointed to build the tabernacle said to Moses, tell the people to stop giving. 
I don't know if you knew this was in the Bible. Tell them to stop giving because what they are giving is sufficient. And then there's that part, Mandy, that goes, woo, way off. And it is too much. Can you think about that? Now, I'm not being weird or, or, or comical when I say that. I'm praying that'll happen at this church. I'm not being a bit comical when I say that. Because you know what? If that's in the Word of God, then that can still happen today. A stirring up of hearts, an anointing of workers, regular, bountiful, sacrificial giving. So here's what I want to ask us to do. I want us to pray in just a moment, and then I want to ask if we will commit. I want you to stand with me if you would, please. How many of you have been praying with us? We, uh, from time to time during our offering time, we do that giving declaration. Uh, Lane, can we get that? I know this is spur of the moment. Can you get that giving declaration ready and put that up on the screen? Here's what we have said when we give. By the authority of your word I have given, it will be given back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's the word of God. Next, next one. I am a tither. I bring my tithe into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked and the curse is broken. The windows of heaven are open. Everybody say open. You pour out on me such a blessing, there is not room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises, bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received, my whole family saved and walking with God, perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessing. I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed going out. All that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, how many of you, since we've started declaring that, have had some of those things come to pass in your life? I have. I've had some debts demolished. My dad told me a long time, it's like getting out of jail. I've had rebates come, refunds. My tax accountant blessed me with an email this week. And just to tell you how, how, how good God is, Friday morning I was praying and I said, Lord, I want to lead the way in this uh, Sunday on our giving. And so I'm, I need to know, are we going to get some money back or is Uncle Sam going to take even more? One hour later, my accountant emailed me and said, here's your refund. And I began to realize God, God's a God of blessing. God's a God of blessing. You received a card that looks like this. If you did, I would like you to take that and just hold it if you would. It looks like this. It says making room. And ushers, I may need you to help me if there are people. If you did not get one of these cards, would you just slip your hand up? Or if you would like to receive one of these, slip your hand. Keep your hand up real quickly if you would. Thank you, ushers, for helping us out. I want to tell this church this, a uh, couple of things. First of all, a lot of prayers going into where we're at as a church right now. If you're new to our church, we don't believe in being underhanded or backdoor when it comes to finances. In about two and a half, well, about two and a half weeks, we'll have an annual business meeting for everybody that financially supports this church. They're welcome to be at that meeting where we'll talk about our finances. We'll talk about the church. You'll see where we're at financially. So we're very prayerful about that. We're also prayerful about sizable investments like we will make in building a building. And so as I was praying, the Lord began to speak into my spirit about how we would go through phases of this. And here's how we're going to do this. I felt the Lord impress me that for four months, I would make a challenge to our church. What can we as individuals sacrifice for four months? Now, what my family is choosing to do is not only answer that monthly, this is up to you how you do this, but we're choosing to not, not only say what can we sacrifice monthly in amount, but also on top of that one time in an amount. So we're giving actually two different things. And that's up to you if you choose to do both or just one of those. 
but we began to pray it. We prayed and asked the Lord, Lord, what, what are you saying? What are you speaking about how I can sacrifice for the next four months, April, May, June, and July? And I know some of you have really prayed about this this week because you've, you've let me know and you've, you've talked to me about that, and I appreciate that. Our ministry team is leading the way. We haven't heard from all of our ministry team, but our ministry team is leading the way, and there's already $8,500 given from just a few people on our ministry team to this campaign of making room. So here's what I'd like us to do. I want us to pray. And I know that we may have come today and said, I have an amount in my mind, but let's pray and ask the Lord and say, Lord, is that what you want or do you want me to sacrifice even more? Would you pray with me right now, Lord? You're going to choose people to make room. That's how you do this, Lord. You stir up the hearts of willing people. So I pray that you will speak to my heart right now, speak to my spirit. Show me, Lord, how I can personally be invested in making room for the expansion of your kingdom. I thank you, Lord. I give you praise. I thank you that you're going to use the people in this room right now to bring about a miracle. I'm so grateful for that so grateful for that back in 2004 many years ago um, we had brother Charles Mahaney come this is brother Nick Mahaney's father brother Charles Mahaney passed on many years ago but he came back in 2004 and I decided to have him on a Tuesday night service a special night of service and the weather was horrible that night and of course this was in the earlier days of our church and we had 19 people in church and Sister Bennett, you were there. But I remember thinking, and I, I actually asked Charles Mahaney to come to just preach on faith and see if we are getting ready to purchase a piece of land for our church. Maybe we can raise an offering to go toward this, this land. It was a piece of land that we paid $40,000 for. And uh, Brother Mahaney showed up. It's Tuesday night. There's 19 people. And in my flesh, John, I walked into the church and looked and thought, Oh, it's going to be tough tonight because I was thinking through my flesh. Brother Mahaney got up. He preached. I have to tell you, I didn't really feel a whole lot. That's not mean toward him. I just didn't feel this rush of faith. And he said, let's give. And people started giving. And I honestly thought, you know, we may get a thousand or two here tonight. We got $19,000 that night from 19 people. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Woo -hoo. I was blown away, Pastor Nate. We signed the papers for the loan the next day, so we were able to put $19,000 on a $40,000 note. Within the next 29 days, we paid that loan off. They made, the bank made $54 on that loan. <laughs> when I went in to finalize the paperwork, we didn't even, they didn't last a month with us. We went in to finalize the paperwork. Here's what the loan guy said. He said, Pastor, congratulations on paying this loan off. If you come back to us for a bigger loan, don't pay it off so fast next time. <laughs> so here's what I'm saying. Here's why I share that story. Because God can do miraculous things when we sacrificially give. So here's what I'd like you to do. If you feel the Lord speaking to you about what you're going to be a part of, what you would like to be a part of, sacrificially to give, I wish you would just jot that down. There's a place there that's perforated. So what we would like to do, there's not going to be public. We're not going to post these anywhere. If you would just fill both of those out, the top and the bottom, and then I'm tearing mine off like this, I'm just going to ask you if you would, to come in just a moment, those that will give and commit, and just lay it up here on the altar face down, just face down. And then this will give us an idea of where we're at in our giving campaign for phase number one. We've had people that are traveling this week for spring break and have said, Pastor, we're going to be a part of that. We're bringing our commitment when we come back. So there will be people that will be joining this effort here. But I believe the Lord is going to help us. I believe the Lord's going to help us. So if you're here and the Lord's dealing with you, would you just fill that out, both the top and the bottom? Just tear off that bottom one and just come and set it right here on the altar. Just face down. 
And, uh, and then once you do that, would you just stay up here and, and we're going to pray together as a church. Those of you that the Lord's stirring up your heart. There might be somebody in here right now. The Lord could speak to you to give $10,000. <clears> the <throat> Lord could speak to you to give equivalent of a car payment every month. That's sacrifice. That's what God can do when we sacrifice. As a church, we move at the speed of generosity. We build at the speed of generosity. No magic here, no pulling rabbits out of hats, just honest and open, giving opportunities. Thank you, Jesus. I will give you all. If you know this, sing it. I will give you all. If all is what you ask of me, I will not withhold. And if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best, Help me remember Calvary's cross. Is that what you feel in your heart today? Come on, sing that again. I will give you all. I will give you all. Oh, I will give you all. Oh, if all is what you ask of me, I will not withhold. Oh, and if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best, help me remember Calvary's cross. Be willing to, come on, sing it again, everybody. Oh, I will give you all. That's our heart, Lord. It's being stirred up. It's being stirred up today, Lord. Oh yes, if all is what I will not withhold. Oh, and if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best, help me remember Calvary's cross. One more time, sing it as a prayer to the Lord. Oh, I will give you all. Yes, I will, Jesus. Hallelujah, if all is what you ask of me, I will not withhold. Hallelujah, then giving you my very Here's how I'd like to end this service. I wish some of you would just step up here and lay your hands right on top of these commitments. I want us to pray a prayer of sanctification over them that God's going to help us to see everything come to pass that's been committed on these cards. Would you do that? Some of you, you don't have to be a minister in our church. Just come up and lay your hands on them. Don't turn them over. Just lay your hands on them. God, we sanctify these commitments to you. We dedicate them to you, Lord. God, we made commitments as you prosper and as you supply. So you're going to do that, Lord, and I'm thankful that you're going to prove yourself strong. We're going to see testimonies of your great hand of provision. So we sanctify these commitments to you right now, God. We give them to you, Lord. Thank you for the power of your provision. Thank you that you're Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. What I'd like you to do on your way out today, if you would, is as you're, if you're parked in the gravel parking lot, because most likely, and we're still working through where the next building will sit footprint-wise on our property, uh, but most of you will be walking to your car 
in a different building soon. So as you're going to your car, I wish you would just say, Lord, thank you for how you're going to provide for this building. As I get in this car today, thank you for how you're going to show yourself strong, how you're going to provide, how you're going to provide. Amen. Turn to someone right now and say, God's going to help us. God's going to provide for us. Sister Dillahay, my goodness, it's great to see you today. Welcome back. Welcome back. We love Sister Dillahay. Amen. We've been praying for her. The Lord's given her strength to be here today, and we honor her. Thank you so much. Friends and guests that are here with us, thank you for coming to New Life. On your way out of here, shake hands and hug somebody's neck and tell them you're happy that uh, they're here. Okay. All the men. All the men.